This is Module 1C, Testing the New Idea. Does it make sense? The objective of this module is to go through some simple examples in terms of trying to identify and evaluate an opportunity. Should we try to do this? Does it make any sense? We're not going to take a complicated case like IBM or Dell. We're going to start with uh, two very simple, almost uh, trivial examples. But uh, what we want to do is to make sure that everyone understands the basic concepts. Why do we want to do this? Well, we want to find out does the plan make sense? Can it possibly work? And what is really meant is that if it doesn't work on paper, it can't work. We'll see later that even though it does work on paper, it may not work, but uh, if putting this down on paper and we come up with some results that say this doesn't make sense or it can't work, then we have some real problems. Also, the idea of a business model, as we'll find out later in the course, uh, one of the major reasons for having it is to track reality, to take a look at the model, take a look at our real results, find out where the differences are, and either take steps, either modify the model, which is always uh, a possibility, or modify and change some of the things that we're doing to bring reality closer to the model. And that may, may mean the difference between uh, running at a loss or running at a profit. We may have to change some of the uh, things that we're doing or not doing. Well, typically, you do not have uh, all of the data that you need to put together a business model. So what? Make assumptions, even wild guesses. One of the things, one of the ways you tip can put together a model is using a spreadsheet, and the nice thing about spreadsheets is that uh, the electronic spreadsheets such as Excel uh, is that you can change parameters whenever you want and uh, the change that one change will ripple through and uh, show you some new results and you can always refine it later on. This is not a formal exercise frequently this is done on a scrap piece of paper while you're on a train or a bus hopefully not driving uh, but in the stereotype, very often these kinds of things are done on the back of a napkin at a restaurant. So let's take a look. Let's try a very simple uh, service business. The scenario is that uh, Bob's an IT expert and he wants to become an independent networking consultant. Well, one question that has to be asked right up front is, should he quit his job, start you know, a new venture as an uh, independent networking consultant? And networking consultant, I'm talking about uh, installing hardware and software, local area networks, routers, uh, maybe for homes small businesses, uh, you know, people who can't afford their own in-house IT people but need somebody to come in and, and uh, put a couple of computers together on a network with a uh, sharing a common router, maybe a, uh, a backup, large backup drive or server. Maybe they have their one of the machines running as a, uh, a website you know, running a web server and uh, 
again, they don't, you know, don't have their own in-house expertise. Should he start this business? Should he just go off and quit his job and, and uh, go make these things happen? Well, that's not always a smart choice. You know, it might be better if he can start part-time because if he can keep his day job, he at least can pay the bills, pay the rent, maybe keep, his, keep up his car payment, and you'll find that many entrepreneurial businesses start part-time. It takes the pressure off, keeps you from making stupid short-range decisions. Now I had the word day job in quotes because there are people uh, and uh, entrepreneurs who firmly believe that probably the best thing to do is to have an evening job like a waiter you know, working from 4 to four to midnight or something like that, 4 to 11, uh, so that during the daytime, 9 to 5 or 9 to 3, something like that, you can focus on your new venture, your new business. And uh, there, there's some merit to that. As I say, I do know an entrepreneur who started that way. Okay, let's start developing this business model. Although it sounds kind of strange, we're going to work backwards. Starting with uh, how much money does Bob need to pay his bills? And let's assume, and this is you know just an example, but let's assume that uh, my expenses are $5,000 a month. How do I come up with that number? Well, it could be pretty easy. Take a look at your checkbook, take a look at your credit card bills, uh, cash you've been spending, you know, go back for the last 12 months and, and take a look at, at what your actual expenses were for all these different things. And okay, let's assume for the moment that uh, in the past year you spent $60,000 to live. Okay. That was net. Well, the other piece of what goes on top of that net is the taxes that you pay to the federal government, state government, local governments. Uh, and accountants will, you know, find a problem with this and say, well, it's not really a third of gross income, uh, but it's close enough. In general, it runs anywhere from some accounts will say 28%, some will say 26%, some will say 35%. But for our purposes, let's say a third. Therefore, the net would be two-thirds of gross. So that our gross income, in order to get a net of 60, has got to be 90 grand a year. One of the things that uh, Bob has to look at at this point is, is this worth it? If he can have a company job where he's working 40 or 45 hours a week or something like that, if in a company and he can make 90 grand a year gross or better, uh, why take the risk? But if Bob wants to be his own boss, be independent, and make more than 90,000 a year, then perhaps it's worth taking the risk of starting your own business. You want to aim high. Okay, let's assume that uh, our business expenses are 10% of revenue. All right. So again, if you do the algebra backwards, you'll add 10, you know, $10,000 per year. Uh, so our revenue has to be $100,000. $100,000 will give us $10,000 a year for expenses and 90 grand a year for Bob's gross income. So that that's the the target we're looking at right now is revenue of 100 grand a year. 
all right, in order to get $100,000 a year, what do we have to do? We've got to allocate our time. Let's assume, let's use 50 weeks for the year. Everybody would like two weeks off, and, and typically there's 10 holidays uh, that come into the year, and uh, so that takes away two weeks' worth of, of work days on five-day weeks. So let's assume we have 50 years at 40 hours a week. How do we split that up? Part of it is going to be billable to the customer. In other words, doing the work, actually installing the network, installing the software, making sure the hardware all plays together, you know, doing the deliverables that uh, come with the job. Another piece of it is going to be administrative work, buying stuff, uh, billing the customer, making sure that you've got the hardware and software that you need to do the jobs, things like that. Reading the mail, if nothing else, answering phone calls. And, another, and the third piece would be marketing getting proposals out, getting uh, flyers out, calling on potential customers. Can we do all of this one-third each? Maybe we can do a little bit less in marketing, a little bit less in administration, and get uh, you know, a thousand hours, half of our time billable thousand hours per year. In order to make hundred thousand dollars, as you can see here, it's pretty easy, uh, or easy to figure out, maybe not easy to do, but we need either a thousand hours at a hundred bucks an hour, or if we can only do a third billable, a third of our time is billable, we need 667 hours at 150 an hour. Well, what should our hourly rate be? As we'll see later in the course, it's kind of hard to figure out what your costs are early on. So most new businesses really look to the competition and uh, find out what the competition charges. Well, how do you find that out? Well, one of the things you do is call them. Check them out. Have a friend. Have a, a relative. Uh, somebody who has a small business who's your friend call your competition say look we're looking at this size job uh, you know what do you guys charge you know how do you figure this and you'd be surprised you can get a lot of information over the telephone from your competitors uh, as to what their rates are and again maybe you know a friend of yours could even get uh, one of these competitors to give a uh, give them a proposal showing some numbers. So let's assume that we did that uh, little bit of market research as it's called, competitive research, and uh, found out they're in the 112 to 150 an hour. So we decided we don't want to be the low price guy on the block at this point. We don't want to be the Walmart, uh, but we don't have a reputation good enough to charge you know, the high-end price. So we'll come in at a hundred and a quarter, and therefore we need 800 hours per year billable to the customer to uh, generate a hundred thousand dollars in revenue. Here's our initial model. We're going to assume that uh, we're working about. 46 to 48 hours a week of, I'm sorry, 46 to 48 weeks per year, all right, and at 125 hours, here's what we need weekly, monthly, annually, and uh, the, ge the revenue generated. So we need $2,100 a week to generate $100,000 a year. Can we do, if we do 17 hours a week billable, that leaves us 23 hours for administration and marketing. 
Is that enough? I don't know. We have to decide. Another question is, what's the size of the market? What's the size of the average job? How many jobs do we need per year? What's our win rate? You can see the questions. Let's again make some assumptions. Or if we've gone out and gotten some research data, either from talking to customers or talking to uh, the competition, just knowledge, general knowledge of the industry, which is important. Make sure you know your industry before you go into it. Let us assume that we say our average job is five grand, therefore we need 20 jobs a year. Are we going to win every job that we bid on or that we send a proposal out, every customer that we give a quote to? I don't think so. All right, let's assume we win one out of three. Therefore, in order to have, get 20 jobs a year, if our win rate is one out of three, we've got to generate 60 proposals per year. Can we handle it? Can we generate five proposals per month, 60 per year? Working 48 weeks out of the year, 40 hours a week, billable is 17, administrative, five hours a week, you know, paying the bills, and you know, answering the general calls, doing the billing. Is that realistic? I don't know. Many times it's not, but you may wind up doing that on your weekends and spending more than 40 hours a week. Most people do. Most entrepreneurs do. And that would leave you 10 hours for marketing and sales. You could always outsource it, but that's expensive. We'll talk about that later in the course. You've got about eight hours a week for proposals. Is that realistic? Which gives you about six hours per proposal at five per month. Again, the arithmetic should be straightforward. All right. Now, is, is that realistic, six hours per proposal? Well, the first one or two are probably going to take you at least twice that. You know, you're going to have to develop uh, a standard template. Once you have developed with Microsoft Word or any other thing you want to use, Excel spreadsheets as part of it, uh, you know, you'll find that the jobs fall into a number of different categories and you'll be able to, you know, go get the old proposal that you did for somebody else uh, two months ago and just relatively easily modify it uh, for this new prospect. So after a while, you should be able to cut down the number of hours per proposal uh, that, that's required. Now the question is, can it work? Suppose we were wrong that uh, our data was not too accurate and the average job was two thousand dollars not five grand. What if our win rate is only one out of five? You can see the questions here. What if our billable rate is too high? Or sales and administration take more time? Well, we can change it. We also want to, when we do start the business, we want to track the initial results tweak the model appropriately, and perhaps identify what in reality needs to be changed. You know, do we have to cut expenses? Do we have to uh, increase prices? You know, spend more time marketing? Spend, you know, more time on proposals so that we increase our win rate? Things like that. And again, this is where things like spreadsheets uh, are very advantageous because we can play games, uh, you know, the, the factors of the average job size. You could see very quickly by plugging in, you know, putting together the proper spreadsheet and just changing the numbers, you know, what it's going to cost you in, in terms of time and effort. So it works out well. 
If it doesn't work on paper, well, again, keep your day job. You know, just start slowly, build it up. You can be committed to your business, but you don't have to commit 100% of your time. You can, and people will uh, argue that with me and say you have to be totally committed to your business. Well, personally, I believe you can be totally committed to the business, but that doesn't mean it has to consume 100% of your energy and your time. Uh, you can keep your day job to stay alive. Of course, you can always forget it. If it doesn't work on paper, you can say this was a lousy idea and go find another one. Or another choice is maybe you say, well, gee, I can't generate that much money. I can't get $60,000 net income, net after tax income. Uh, I got to give up my leased Mercedes and go buy a couple of hundred dollar junker. Uh, maybe I go back and live with my parents if that's a, an option. People do that. People do that all the time to put all of their spare money into the business so that uh, they can get started. And again, cut back on the lifestyle and wait until things get better. Okay, let's take a look at a product example. Here's the scenario. Very again, a very trivial, very simple, almost uh, you know, ludicrous example. But I'm doing it for a reason, just to to keep it uh, keep it very simple. We've got a, a soda fountain. Maybe it's a little kiosk. Maybe it's a, a store in a large office building. And we're only going to sell one thing: soda, one size, eight ounces. Okay, what supplies do we need? for each kind of soda. Well, we need a, a cup, we need some carbonated water, we need syrup, a straw, some ice, and maybe a cover for the soda. Maybe, you know, a napkin or two napkins. All right. Let's assume that we've done some pricing and gone out and got, you know, some quotes from suppliers and that. And we figure out that the average cost of a cup of soda is six cents. What do we call? that cost. And again, a prerequisite for this course was uh, a finance course. So you should you should know that that's called the variable cost. A variable cost varies or is so much per unit and varies with the amount produced. So again, six cents per soda. A variable cost. Well, the other kind of cost involves things like overhead and equipment. What do we need? Well, we got the cost of the kiosk or the rent, you know, rental on it or rental in this small store down on the main floor of the office building. Um, need a counter, need a cash register, uh, lighting, you know, energy. Again, basically, I'll say at this point in time that I feel it's more of a fixed cost, at least for our model's purposes, because we're going to be open a certain amount of time. Uh, part of that is, is you, know, you know, maybe we've got uh, the actual soda dispenser, you know, that dispenses the soda water, mixes it with the syrup. So, let's assume that the overhead and equipment costs ten thousand dollars per year again we may have gone out and gotten some prices maybe we've talked with somebody who's in this kind of business and that's you know just a rough number what's that overhead and equipment cost called that's a fixed 
cost because it doesn't vary with the sodas produced. We're going to have that $10,000 of cost whether we sell one soda or a million sodas. Bob still wants his 90 grand a year gross, before, uh, again gross income before taxes so that the total of the overhead equipment and income is a hundred grand and if you take a look at our the first cut of our business model if we sell only one soda per year we've got a hundred thousand dollars in fixed costs plus six cents for the soda very expensive soda hundred thousand dollars and six cents for one eight ounce soda if we sell a thousand sodas you can see the price comes down to hundred dollars still not in the right price range if we sell a hundred thousand sodas per year then we're someplace realistic a buck six per soda uh, cost the cost or, or unit cost per soda is a dollar six that slide that unit should be a space between cost and unit. Well, let's assume we're going to be open 300 days a year, six days a week, 50 weeks out of the year. We'll close for two weeks vacation. Uh, we're going to sell a thousand sodas a day. So that's eighteen thousand dollars. Okay thousand sodas a day for 300 days out of the year that's 300,000 sodas so the cost unit cost per soda is now 39 cents so if we charge anything over 39 cents for this 8 ounce soda we're making a profit can we sell 300,000 sodas per year well you can see what our business plan should say answer yes we can Well, the question is, this shows that the plan can work. It doesn't say that it will work. As we go further into this course, we're going to talk about luck, unforeseen events, things like that. Well, what kind of unforeseen problem could happen to Bob Soda Fountain? Well, in the scenario we use, they're in an office building. Suppose that office building is a big office building uh, primarily occupied by somebody like AT&T or Lucent or maybe one of the investment houses right now, you know, that uh, have gone belly up and the employees go through a big layoff. Okay, Instead of 3,000 employees in there, maybe there's only 300 now. It wasn't your fault. You had nothing to do with it. You were just in the wrong place at the wrong time. Or even a major disaster. Even worse, a disaster like uh, the World Trade Center back in 2001. Totally unforeseen totally outside the realm of control of uh, the small business people who are part of the World Trade Center complex. Uh, just bad luck sometimes. Bad things do happen. So, you know, you need the hard work and you need luck. The model becomes the start of your business plan. It uh, you then take the business plan and put the assumptions that you've made, the information that uh, you've gathered via research and the information that supports the business model puts it all in writing so that people can work through it and see that your business model and the plan itself uh, makes sense. In turn, the business plan provides a baseline for measuring and changing the business, uh, improving the areas where that need improvement. All right, in our next module we shall take a look at the characteristics of successful entrepreneurs uh, what do they look like age groups uh, you know skills needed 
and uh, delve a little bit into the idea of mentoring and looking for uh, support networks and things like that. We will also explore sources of ideas for innovation. Where do you find new ideas to come up with new products and services. And this could either be in the realm of uh, starting a new venture or in the realm of a corporate entrepreneurship, coming up with something new, something innovative within the context of a large corporation. So please join me in the next module. Thank you.